Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. When I was asked to take on the chairmanship of the National Rail Heritage Awards by my good friend and predecessor, John Ellis, whose contribution to the awards, among others, is immense, I was looking forward to introducing the annual event in Merchant Taylor's Hall and to taking part in the ensuing stimulating conversations in convivial surroundings. I had not foreseen COVID intervening and resulting in this virtual ceremony. Anyway, needs must, and we have kept to the usual format. That nearly all of the entries have been inspected and judged is quite remarkable and very much due to Clive Baker's organisation as well as his travels. And we are particularly indebted to our chairman of judges. The National Rail Heritage Awards can only survive as a result of the support of our sponsors. And we would like to thank them for their ongoing backing. Without them, the event would not be possible. We are grateful to them for their continuing support during these difficult times. Without further ado, I hand over to Ian Musty for the annual review. We begin with the BAM Nuttall Partnership Award. This is given for the greatest heritage improvement works made to any historic railway structure as part of a jointly funded project. There are three shortlisted candidates for the award this year, the first of which is for the restoration of the fascias at Harlow Town Station in Essex, which was entered by Greater Anglia Railways. The Grade 2 listed station, one of only a handful of modern stations to be so protected, was designated by the British Railway's Eastern Region Architect and was completed in 1960. It was one of a number of modern stations built in conjunction with the line's electrification. Over the past 60 years, certain elements of the station's construction have deteriorated. In particular, the existing ply fascias had faded from their original colour to a dull, weather-worn white, with extensive rotting in parts. In January 2019, a 13-month project costing just over £1 million was started. This was funded by the train operator and by the Railway Heritage Trust. The work involved the replacement of the existing plywood fascias with glass reinforced polymer in hollybush green. The colour scheme was selected to reflect the colours adopted when the rebuilt station was completed. The fascias of this highly regarded and important station have always been a weakness. This project, which has restored the station to the condition in which it was built, and therefore showing off to advantage one of the best examples of the architecture of the period. It is an excellent example of how modern materials can be integrated into an historic structure to retain its appearance and enhance its presence. The second shortlisted candidate, entered by the Pitlochry Station Bookstall, covers the restoration of the Salt House at Pitlochry Station in Scotland. Opened with the Highland Main Line north from Perth in 1863, Pitlochry Station is now listed Grade A. The entry covered the former washroom that had latterly been used as a salt store and the adjacent lavatories. As a result of the use of the space as a salt store, the windows, doors, floor and internal finishes had become degraded. In particular, there were structural failures in the lintels. With funding drawn from a number of sources, including the Railway Heritage Trust, Scott Rail, the Basel Death Trust and numerous small donations, an eight-month project to convert the erstwhile salt into a charity bookshop. Externally, the work included the replacement of the lintels as well as the doors and windows to replicate the original design. Internally, the work has been completed to a high standard with attractive detailing. 
although the original urinals were retained but boxed in to protect them, other plumbing features and pipework were removed. A replacement floor was also installed, with the end result being a highly flexible and useful space. Over the years, the community engagement in the restoration of Pitlock Station has been impressive, and this new project is equally so. The station's charity bookshop had proved itself a success before this project. The adaption of the store to create a bookstore has furthered this work and has inspired further projects at the station. The final entry was entered by the YMCA Dulverton Group and covers the restoration of the Grade 2 listed former Great Western Hotel at Taunton. When originally opened in the early 1840s, the hotel was privately owned and was considerably smaller than the structure that exists today. Over the years the building was extended to its present extent before being modernised in 1931. Used as offices for more than 50 years and disused since 2008, the building's condition deteriorated and it became something of an eyesore and it is likely that the only thing that saved it from being demolished was the fact that it was listed. Following their work on a similar project, the YMCA Dulverton Group commenced an 18-month project costing £650,000 in December 2018 to restore the building as a hotel. Externally, the building was restored to its original external brick finish, with work also being undertaken on the rainwater goods and windows. Original 1896 painted signs were discovered during the work and suitably conserved. Internally, many of the features had been lost during the building's use as offices. Those that remained, such as a fireplace, tarred flooring and doors, were retained and, where appropriate, replicated. Those spaces not required for use by the hotel have been successfully converted into modern offices and workshops. There was a very real threat that this historically important building might have been lost. The entrants are to be congratulated in taking the building on and restoring it for both hotel and commercial use and thus complementing and enhancing the adjacent station environment. So, which of these fascinating trio is the winner of the BAM Nuttall Partnership Award 2020? I'm pleased to announce that the award of the BAM Nuttall Partnership Award for 2020 goes to Greater Anglia Railways for the restoration of the Fashiers at Harlow Town Station. The NRHA Craft Skills Award recognises the best use of traditional craft skills in restoring a heritage building or structure. There are three shortlisted projects for this award. The first of this trio was entered by Colt Construction Limited for the restoration of Appleby North Signal Box. Located at the junction between the Settle to Carlisle line and the link to the erstwhile North Eastern Railway route across the Pennines, Appleby North Signal Box was constructed as a typical LMS type 11C box when it was completed in 1951. Currently not scheduled to be replaced for a number of years, the unlisted box was in need of structural repair and refurbishment of this all-timber structure. As work progressed, it became evident that five of the six perimeter columns were decayed, seriously compromising the timber footing with evidence that the building was suffering slight subsidence. In November 2019, work started costing almost £600,000. The project was completed in four months. To achieve the desired result, a complex engineering solution was required. 
The temporary steel framework installed to support the box structure permitted work to be undertaken on the foundations and the perimeter columns whilst keeping the box operational. New timber was inserted where required and a new staircase and toilet block constructed. The roof was reslated with Welsh slate and windows repaired or replaced as required, retaining the loosely Midland Railway design of the double glazed units installed in 2004 to suit the local ethos. The entry is a very good lesson in how a locally significant structure can be reconstructed and retained while still meeting essential operational needs during the work. The planning of the complex work required is noteworthy and its execution extremely good with the extensive foundation work hardly visible. The second shortlisted entry was made by Network Rail for the restoration of the footbridge at Arnside on the Carnforth to Barrow line. The footbridge is an excellent example of a single square-sided steel lattice girder footbridge with a haunched span and cast iron columns. It was originally erected by the Furness Railway in about 1910. Inevitably, years of use and the coastal environment had taken their toll on the structure and in October 2019 work commenced on a project costing £370,000 to restore the bridge. The scheme had two primary aims. The first was to restore the steel and ironwork and repair any damaged sections. The second was to try and make the structure as compliant as possible to the requirements of the 21st century railway. Following the erection of a full wraparound scaffold, the footbridge was carefully stripped back to remove corrosion, inevitable with a 110 year old structure. Wherever possible, the original latticework strips were repaired, while those beyond repair were replaced with new strip to the same dimensions. The whole was then fully repainted. The original timber deck and stair treads had been replaced by GRP some years ago and it was decided to replace these like for like. The additional handrails needed for DDA compatibility have been sensitively added to the staircases. Due to issues with width it was not found possible to add handrails to the main span. It's excellent that Network Rail have respected the nature of this heritage bridge and maintained its integrity. Needs have been considered and built into the finished work, but without compromising the overall aspect of this lovely bridge and its attractive setting. This is a project that's been well executed with care and consideration whilst also coping with the operational challenges. The third shortlisted candidate is for the work undertaken on the long excursion platform seat at Scarborough Station and was entered by Network Rail. Now listed as Grade 2, the bench at some 139 metres in length is reputed to be the longest platform bench in the world. The seat is included in the listing description of the excursion station. As this was designed by William Bell for the North Eastern Railway and constructed in 1883, it is likely that the original seat dates from the same time. The need to provide separate facilities for excursion traffic was a practical necessity as the purpose was to clear the main station and disperse passengers as fast as possible. At that time a canopy extended over the platform as far west as the road bridge so waiting return excursion passengers using the seat would have been under cover. The recent work carried out admirably by Network Rail's own workforce has seen the replacement of all the timber elements using acetylated timber formed to match the profile of the current existing elements 
and to ensure durability. The brackets have been refurbished and the whole seat painted and repainted. The work has been carried out to a high standard. The two network rail artisans who carried out the work and who were present at the judging were justifiably proud of their work and had a real respect for the history of the seat. All in all, three very contrasting projects, and so which entry has won the NRHA Craft Skills Award 2020? And the winner is... Cult Construction Limited for the thorough and careful work undertaken in the complete restoration of the signal box at Appleby North. We now move on to the Arch Company Urban Heritage Award. This award recognises the success of a train operator, station owner or other partnership in ensuring consistently high quality upkeep and enhancement of the environment of a significant urban station within its care, so as to perpetuate the historic ambiance consistent with modern passenger requirements. There are three shortlisted entries in this category. The first of these was entered by LNER and Network Rail for work undertaken on various projects at Berwick-on-Tweed station. Situated above the River Tweed and built upon the site of the medieval castle, the station at Berwick was rebuilt by the original London and North Eastern Railway in 1924 with a new main building constructed in red sandstone. Over the past five years, there have been a number of projects to restore and upgrade the station. Three years ago, the major work undertaken on the roof and associated balustrade were entered. This project was significant and included the reslating of the roof and conservation to the cast iron balustrade in addition to the repair to the associated flat roofs and lantern. Over the past couple of years work has been undertaken on the concourse area. When this started the contractors discovered that rather than destroying the original features the earlier modernization of the station had merely covered them over. A quick rethink resulted in revisions to the scheme with the result that the original wood panelling and skirtings were restored and can now be seen in the booking office and the coffee shop. Such flexibility in undertaking the project is most commendable. The interiors including the new lighting of the booking office and coffee shop are contemporary and attractive and they blend well with the restored original features. For 2020, Network Rail entered the replacement fencing installed on the east side between the station and the car park. This work has been carefully considered and executed, reflecting the fact that the fence structure was erected on top of a scheduled monument. Also worthy of note is the relocated and restored Berwick Lineside sign which is now positioned in a much more visible location. The successive projects completed at Berwick have revitalised the LNER station building. The work on the roof and balustrade was excellent and the recently completed installation of the fencing and the sign has been achieved carefully, recognising the significance of the station's site. The second shortlisted entry in this category come from Network Rail for work undertaken on the platform canopies and Dana footbridge at Shrewsbury Station. Shrewsbury Station dated originally to 1849, but the joint Great Western and London and North Western structure owes much both to its enlargement in the early 20th century and to rebuilding after the loss of the surviving section of the overall roof in the early 1960s. Unfortunately, timber decay had resulted in the deterioration of the glazed canopies and the associated Dana footbridge, network rail owned, 
but a public right of way and not providing any direct access to the platforms had also severely suffered from its exposed location. Work started in November 2018 on an extensive 12-month project to restore both the canopies and the footbridge. Where necessary, on the canopies, the original woodwork was replaced, whilst all the steelwork was stripped back to bare metal prior to repainting. The glazing was replaced by wire polycarbonate, whilst attention was also given to the guttering and drainage. The work on the footbridge was arguably more complex, in that it required the installation of safety decking over the running lines. Much of the metal and wooden framework required for refurbishment or replacement, though again it is now difficult to see what is old and what is replacement. One change that was made was the replacing of the corrugated iron roof with bronze sheet with interlocking joints. This is a very worthwhile scheme that has been well thought through and well executed. It has the distinct advantage of demonstrating how much can be achieved without overtly affecting the integrity of the historic structure. The third entry in this category has been made by Trenitalia C2C Limited for the repurbishment of the booking hall at Upminster Station in Greater London. Upminster Station was opened in 1885 by the London, Tilbury and South End Railway. From the early 1930s it was also the eastern terminus of the London Underground District Line. The unlisted booking hall would appear to be part of the original late 19th century structure and has suffered over the years. In September the entrance started a nine-month project costing just over one and a quarter million pounds to refurbish the space. The aim with the project was, wherever possible, to refurbish the historic features of the building whilst making them suitable for the needs of the contemporary railway. Externally, this work included the introduction of new metal rainwater goods and the replacement of the sash windows to the original specification. A significant improvement was the removal of the modern suspended ceiling in the ticket hall to expose the original roof structure, which has been well lit with uplighting considerably improving the ambience and sense of space. A small commercial space was created on the upside, London direction, which has been let to a cafe. Together with the new flooring and complete refinishing, this work has considerably improved the passenger environment. This project has taken an historic structure and with care and attention to detail made it a much more user-friendly and attractive facility for users of the station. The entrants are to be congratulated on taking this amount of effort with a building that is currently unlisted. Three very varied and interesting entries, but which of them has been most successful in the eyes of the adjudicators? I'm pleased to announce that the Arch Company Urban Heritage Award for 2020 goes to l &ER and and Network Rail for the excellent work over the years at Berwick-on-Tweed Station. Next we come to the Structures Restoration Award sponsored by Costain. This award is given for the successful restoration, modification or adaption for new use of any historic railway or tramway civil engineering structure in any ownership. There are three shortlisted entries for this award. The first of the entries was made by Network Rail for the restoration of the Coggan footbridge in Cardiff. Constructed by the Barry Railway for the station's opening in 1888, the Grade 2 listed footbridge is built from cast and wrought iron. The bridge design incorporated ornamental features, including decorative floral moulding around the capitals and ball finials. 
By 2018, various elements of the structure required repair, replacement or updating including the deck, wrought iron latticework and timber treads while two of the ball finials had disappeared. The footbridge was dismantled and removed to workshops where the lower cords which support the main span were replaced due to major corrosion. Other repairs included replacing the missing cast iron ball finials and the timber stair treads and decking. Consultation with the conservation officer resulted in the installation of FRP decking and stair treads to achieve a much improved lifespan. There was a requirement to provide handrails and lighting for the stair flights and an opportunity was taken to incorporate LED lights into the handrails, reducing unnecessary visual impact. Cast iron pipework was installed across the main span of the footbridge to provide an unobtrusive conduit for electrical cables that were previously slung from under the bridge. Overall, the appearance of the footbridge with its well-applied paintwork and sympathetic repairs is a credit to the restoration team and makes a marked improvement to the station on Virons. The second of the shortlisted entries was made by Network Rail and covers the restoration of four railway bridges in central Manchester. The four structures concerned are firstly the Deansgate Bridge, constructed in cast iron and completed in 1849. The bridge was subsequently widened using wrought iron girders. The other three bridges are those that span Great Ducey Street. The first of these, the Cast Iron Stevenson Bridge, was initially opened in 1844 and extended using wrought iron in the early 1880s. The middle bridge was opened by the Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway in 1863, whilst the North Bridge was again constructed by the Lancashire and Yorkshire and opened in 1894. The North Bridge became redundant in the early 1990s as a result of track rationalisation and the construction of the Manchester Arena. Over the years, the condition of the Grade 2 listed bridges had significantly deteriorated and in January 2019, work started on a 20-month project costing £5 million to restore them. For all the bridges, the work included attention to the hidden critical elements, stone and brickwork repairs, improvement to the rainwater goods, including new cast elements where needed, and finally, a comprehensive repaint in a new protective scheme. Although the intention was to retain as much of the original structures as possible, it was recognised that elements that had been lost or damaged beyond repair would need to be replaced. For the Great Juicy Bridges, almost 50 decorative elements were cast at the Bar and Grosvenor Foundry, whilst a further 13 were supplied by the Shakespeare Foundry for the Deansgate Bridge. This whole scheme of four bridge refurbishments is impressive and could so easily be dismissed as just repainting, but this is far from the case as much structural work has been undertaken. The result is that the streetscape is visually improved and the work will extend the life of these structures for decades. The final shortlisted entry was made by Network Rail for the repair to New Mills Newtown Station footbridge. The largely cast iron Grade 2 listed footbridge was constructed by the London and North Western Railway in the mid 19th century. Following years of deterioration, Work commenced in January 2020 on a four-month project costing almost £350,000 to restore the bridge. Working closely with the local conservation officer, it was decided to work on the structure in situ, as moving to an offside location would have potentially led to damage. 
a wraparound scaffold system was employed so that train operation could be maintained while work progressed. After the removal of the existing lead paint, a thorough patch repair and repaint of all the ironwork was carried out throughout the span and access steps. In addition, strengthening works has been undertaken to the footbridge span to address structural concerns identified in the surveying process. Replacement of the steel treads was undertaken to all the steps and finished with an anti-slip finish and painted nosings. A number of lattice strings were in need of replacement which was done by skilled welders to complement the originals. This is a thoroughly professional job carried out by Network Rail and its contractor to a high quality with thorough attention to detail. The end result is a much improved bridge that will stand the test of time for many years. So three attractive schemes here for our adjudicators to decide upon, but the winner of the Costain Structures Award 2020 is for the four bridges in Manchester and its network rail. The London Underground Operational Enhancement Award is given for the scheme that demonstrates the greatest improvement in user accessibility while still sustaining the location's heritage features. There are three shortlisted entries for this category. The first of these was made by the East Lancashire Railway for the canopy at Rawton Stall Station. In the 1980s, following the preservation of the line from Bury, the railway undertook the construction of a new terminus station at Rawton Store using reclaimed railway building materials. There are plans for the further development of the structure and this includes the provision of a station canopy. Following the closure of the ex-Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway Mumps station at Oldham in 2009, to permit the conversion of the line to become part of the Manchester Metrolink system, the surviving late 19th century platform canopy was secured by the East Lancashire Railway. Part was used to construct a new canopy at Berry Bolton Street and part for the work recorded here. In March 2019, work commenced on a project costing almost £50,000 at Rawton Store. The project was completed in January 2020. Work to refurbish the canopy was initially undertaken at the railway's Buckley Wells Shed before transfer by rail to Rawtonstall. The detailed work on the canopy is excellent. The height of the canopy is greater than the adjacent building, but the interface has been well executed. The canopy fits in well with the BR era condition of the station and its Lancashire and Yorkshire vernacular. It was good that the columns were surrounded by stone, not concrete, where they punch through the platform surface. It is planned to extend the canopy, hence the temporary plain end screen. This is an attractive scheme that has improved significantly the facilities on offer at the station. The reuse of the historic canopy reinforces well the historic ambiance that the railway is seeking to create at its northern terminus. The second shortlisted entry for the award is for the refurbishment of the canopy and footbridge at Rill Station and was made by Network Rail. The station was originally designed by Francis Thompson for the Chester and Holyhead Railway and opened in 1848. It was completely rebuilt and massively enlarged in 1900 to capture for the burgeoning increase in traffic as the town grew as a result of the growth in seaside holidays. Over the years, the location's proximity to the sea has led to some deterioration in the Grade 2 listed structures, as well as the increasing problems caused by the presence of seagulls. In August 2018, 
Work commenced on a nine-month scheme costing some one and a half million pounds to restore the canopies and footbridge whilst also addressing the seagull issue. The aim of the project was to restore like for like to retain the heritage appearance of the station. The footbridge required reglazing but this was undertaken to replicate the original whilst work was also completed to strengthen the footbridge's metalwork. All metalwork elements of the canopies and footbridge were cleaned and fully repainted. All buried column elements were inspected for defects and repaired where necessary, whilst new twin-fix glazing was fitted to the canopies. In addition, for ease of future maintenance, new walkways were installed along the canopies. As holiday traffic to the North Wales coast has declined, so the scale of Riddle Station has become too large for current needs. Without intervention, it is possible that the station could have become a run-down eyesore, and Network Rail is to be congratulated for making the effort to restore the facilities at this once grand station. The final shortlisted entry for the award is for the refurbishment of the canopy and footbridge at Stirling Station and was entered by Network Rail and Story Contracting Limited. Although the first station to serve Stirling was constructed for the Caledonian Railway and first opened in 1848, the Grade A listed station that exists today is largely the work of the Caledonian's then architect James Miller and completed in the years immediately prior to the outbreak of World War I. Pictured here in 2011, before work started on the two projects that comprised the word work undertaken at the station, the restoration work was complicated by the necessity of incorporating the overhead power supply equipment associated with the electrification of the line through to Alloa. The first phase of the work, completed before the arrival of the overhead line equipment, comprised the restoration of the platform canopies. The work here involved the removal of the original glazing, the insertion of new glazing bars, the inspection and repair of the supporting structures and the incorporation of some 2,440 square metres of new self-cleaning polycarbonate glazing material. More recently, the necessary OHLE has been sensitively incorporated onto the existing structure. The second phase of the work encompassed the work undertaken on the footbridge. Here, the project was complicated by the necessity of raising the footbridge in order to provide adequate clearance over the OHLE. Commendably, the bridge was retained and raised rather than being replaced. Other work included the stripping and repainting of all timber and metal sections, the provision of replacement stonework as well as improved disabled access. Work started in December 2017 and was completed in August 2019. The amount of research and attention to detail throughout the works is very impressive. Where possible, existing materials have been reused and the new structures blend seamlessly into this iconic and well laid out station. Well done to all involved in both projects, as it's so often easier when lines are electrified to opt for new and utilitarian structures rather than preserve the existing heritage. Three fascinating and complex projects there, I think you will agree. But the London Underground Operational Enhancement Award 2020 is made to Network Rail and Story Contracting Limited for the work undertaken over the several years at Stirling Station on the footbridge and canopies. The Railway Heritage Trust Conservation Award 
is for the best restored listed or historic structure to which the Trust has contributed funding. And we begin with the first of the three very different entries shortlisted for this award. The first covers work undertaken at Dumbarton Central Station, in particular the restored ridge tiles, and has been entered by Network Rail. Although the railway first reached Dumbarton in 1850, the Grade A listed station that survives today was built in 1896. The station is elevated above the town, with access to the island platform through an underpass with its Gothic-style arch and iron gates at the entrance. As a result of detailed examination of the roof, it was established that the existing slates were life-expired and would require replacement. The survey also highlighted that the ornate red clay roof tiles were also in poor condition, with many damaged or missing. A schedule of repair was established costing £365,000 for both roofs and site work was scheduled for 2019. Working in close liaison with the local conservation officer for West Dumbartonshire, a suitable Welsh slate was located which was the nearest match to the existing Scottish slate and this resolved the first challenge. The ridge tiles proved a bigger challenge as there was no off-the-shelf solution to these ornate ridge tiles. A tile supplier was located in Nottingham who could manufacture the new tiles. One of the existing ridge tiles was removed from the roof and used as a template to create the new tiles which satisfied the planning obligation to match the existing. It is believed that this company actually made the original tiles, strengthening the heritage link. The finished works are of a high quality, with good attention to detail throughout the site. The highlight is the reinstatement of the ridge tiles, which now have the same appearance as they did in 1896, some 124 years ago. The second shortlisted candidate was entered by Network Rail and covers work undertaken to reinstate historic fencing at Lanark Station in Scotland. Lanark Station is a Grade B listed structure that was originally opened by the Caledonian Railway in 1867. A terminus station, the railings that are the feature of this entry, are located at the rear of the buffers in the concourse area on top of a retaining wall protecting passengers from the long drop onto the main road below. Over the years, part of the fencing had been replaced by a crude rail and mesh fence, which detracted from the appearance of the station as people approached it. In March 2019, work started on a large scheme to improve the station. Part of this work was to see the replacement of the inappropriate section of fencing to match the original, and this element of the project cost some £25,000 and was completed in August 2019. The upright supports are made from cast iron and involve making a mould from the existing railing to ensure a perfect match was achieved. In total, there are 11 supports manufactured. The 10 infill panels between the upright supports were constructed in mild steel and were again modelled on the existing railings. Several of the red sandstone coping stones were repaired and replaced as part of the works. Well done to all involved in the works and Network Rail and their co-funders Railway Heritage Trust for making this small but visually much improved change to the appearance of Lanark Railway Station. The final candidate for this award was the entry made by Greater Morpeth Development Trust, Northern and Network Rail for the refurbishment of the offices at Morpeth Station in Northumberland. Now listed Great 2, the station at Morpeth originally opened courtesy of the York, Newcastle and Berwick Railway, a forerunner of the North Eastern, in March 1847. 
Designed by Green, the station was completed in a neo-Tudor style in dressed stone with Welsh slate. As with so many stations, the once ample accommodation provided has proved overly generous in the modern era and, as elsewhere, much of the building at Morpeth was disused and unoccupied, leading to deterioration of the structure. Externally, a considerable amount of stonework has been carefully replaced. This includes the restoration of the once removed chimney stacks. The multitude of windows and doors have also received attention. The rainwater goods have either been sympathetically restored or replaced on a like-for-like -like basis. The slate roof has also received attention. Internally, a new ticket office and toilets have been created in one area of the main entrance hall. On the opposite side of this large hall is a cafe with full kitchen facilities. The remaining ground floor area and all first floor spaces have been converted into small office units of varying size. All this work has been completed to a high standard and all original features, such as a north-eastern railway fire surround, have been retained and restored. The driving force behind this scheme was the Greater Morpeth Development Trust. They and Network Rail are to be congratulated for the work undertaken both internally and externally on this important and attractive station. Altogether, some fascinating examples of different types of conservation project, which the adjudicators found very, very difficult to differentiate. But I am pleased to announce that the Railway Heritage Trust Conservation Award 2020 goes to Greater Morpeth Development Trust, Northern and Network Rail for the superb work undertaken at Morpeth. Now we come to the Volunteers Award, sponsored by the Hendy and Pendle Trust. This award reflects the fact that many of the projects that we see, particularly on heritage railways, have relied on volunteers, both to raise the funding and also to undertake the actual physical work. It is for this reason that this award is the only one today that comes with a financial contribution to support the winning entry. There are three shortlisted entries for this special recognition of volunteer contributions. We start off with the signal box at Earlham Station in Greater Manchester that was entered by the Hamilton Davis Trust. The structure is Midland Railway Type 2A signal box of a type constructed between 1884 and 1893. Completed originally in 1884, this is now the oldest box of this type to survive. When originally built, the box was located in Keithley and controlled the junction between the main line and the now preserved Worth Valley branch line to Oxenhope. Slightly relocated due to electrification of the main line in 1994, the redundant box remained at Keithley until spring 2019 when the entrance, working together with Network Rail, got listed building consent to relocate the building to Earlham. Work started in April 2019 on the box's reconstruction, with the work being completed 12 months later. The roof slates were removed and roof timbers replaced as necessary. The lower locking room level, where the original had deteriorated, was completely rebuilt following the original design, whilst the upper operating floor was largely restored as it was in better condition. The locking room mechanical equipment came unassembled and only represented the 11 levers in use when in the last years of service. The point cranks Long drop bars and pulleys are therefore not original, but have been replaced with similar items. The lever frame and all the upper floor mechanical equipment has been stripped down, fully serviced and repainted. The lower locking room equipment has also been stripped down and repainted. 
Overall, this is a very well executed scheme, which is taken at risk signal box, which was reaching the end of its life and moved it to a new location where it has a secure future and can be cared for and is available for public viewing. The new and restoration work has been very thoroughly carried out with workmanship to a very high standard. The second of the shortlisted entries in this category was entered by the Festiniog Railway for the work undertaken at Minforth on the Gwythi or Workshop building. Originally built in about 1920 as a place of worship, the building was acquired by the Festiniog Railway in the mid-1990s for use by volunteers undertaking a number of tasks on behalf of the railway. However, over the years the condition of the building deteriorated. Work started in April 2018 on a two-year programme to restore the building. Structurally, the work included the replacement of the badly rusted steel roof and of the corroded, corrugated iron wall cladding. In addition, all window frames were renewed to the original pattern, whilst the wooden structural framing was also repaired. Internally, whilst the majority of doors were retained and repaired, a number of replacements were acquired locally to replicate the origins. The tongue and grooved wooden cladding was repaired and again carefully replaced where necessary. The kitchen and lavatory areas were also brought up to modern standards, including disabled access. All in all, this is a superb outcome. This building could easily have fallen into such disrepair that restoration was impractical, or simply not an attractive idea. This intervention, though, has reversed that. The direction of this scheme formed a notable last project for a long-standing FR stalwart, Eileen Clayton MBE, who sadly died before the work was completed, having maintained her enthusiasm for and involvement in the railway whilst battling multiple sclerosis. It stands as an example of her vision, her ability to enthuse and direct others, and is an exec excellent exemplar to other supporters of heritage railways of what can be aspired to and achieved. The third entry was made by the Dean Forest Railway Society for the recreation of the up platform shelter at Park End Station. The station was originally opened by the Seven and Y Joint Railway in September 1875. It was provided with both a main station building on the downside and a much smaller passenger shelter on the up. Although passenger services to Park End ceased on the 8th of July 1929, the station was still used for occasional excursion traffic to the early 1960s. Following the cessation of British Rail freight traffic over the line from Lydney in 1976, the branch was preserved by the Dean Forest Railway, with the station being gradually restored by the Society's volunteers. Reopened to Heritage Services in 2006, the final element of the station's restoration was to replace the lost up platform shelter. The main objective was to construct an accurate replica whilst meeting current operational and legislative requirements. As nothing remained of the shelter save a small section of foundation and no drawings of the original structure were available, a detailed programme of research was undertaken using the few available photographs of the original shelter. The shiplap timber cladding is non-standard, matching the main station building and has been specially manufactured. The fascia boards are scalloped and again have had to be specially produced. Roof slates were reclaimed from a nearby building and recycled bricks used for the flooring. One feature of the reconstruction unlikely to have been required on the original are the gates. Discreet when the station is open, these are designed to protect the building from the local marauding sheep, which have a somewhat fearsome reputation. 
The work on the shelter was seen as the ideal memorial to Mervyn Thomas, who passed away in 2018, but who had been the leader of the volunteers restoring the station. This is a delightful little railway building. Great care has been taken in its design and construction, and the result must be satisfying to all involved, as well as being a fitting tribute to a former colleague. Three very differing and impressive schemes, but which of this trio has caught the eye of the awards panel? The winner of the Hendy and Pendle Trust Volunteers Award 2020 is the Festinial Railway for the inspiring restoration of the workshop at Minford. We move on now to the Network Rail Community Award. This is a new award for 2020 and is designed to recognise the restoration, refurbishment or other improvement of a station or building either by a community group or for a community use that connects communities and promotes social inclusion. There are three shortlisted entries. The first of these was made by Working for Health CIC and the Old Lamp Room Limited for work undertaken at Cottingham Station on Humberside. Cottingham Station was built for the York and North Midland Railway and was designed by G.T. Andrews. Opened in 1846, the station is now listed Grade 2. The entry comprises two elements. These are the provision for Working for Health CIC within the former station building and the old lamp room cafe within the small range of buildings adjacent to the footbridge. The old lamp room has had over the years a number of different uses. It had been used as a storeroom and included a back office where the staff did the paperwork. The building on platform two was originally the old booking office and ladies waiting room. The exterior of the old booking hall had been restored as part of an earlier scheme, but the interior remained to be completed. Working for Health, a charity that provides employment support for people with mental health conditions, undertook the work. The fitting out, which retained surviving original features, has been completed to a high standard. The ply panelling over the platform facing windows remained when the judge visited as due to lockdown the building was not fully operational. The old lamp room had previously suffered from a fire so the building was totally gutted and taken back to its original brickwork whilst a connecting doorway was created. In addition a full rewire was carried out and a fire alarm installed. Some walls have been sandblasted and left as a feature. All the work has been completed to a high standard. This project has resulted in a previously unmanned station with unloved buildings being effectively brought back to life. There is a vitality to it with the added bonus that a presence on the station aids the security. The second entry was made by Network Rail for the restoration of two timber buildings at Dumfries in southwest Scotland. Although Dumfries station originally opened courtesy of the Glasgow Dumfries and Carlisle Railway in 1848, the station that exists today is largely the result of its expansion in the mid-1860s to cater for the line westwards to Castle Douglas and Stranra. Over recent years, much has been achieved at Dumfries to restore the station. Two timber cottages in the garden at its south end thus came to attention. These are thought to have been a chargeman's hut and a parcels office, but both, especially the latter, had deteriorated into an awful condition. Network Rail set about stopping the rot by carrying out necessary external works to make the buildings wind and watertight. 
This entailed renewal of slate roofs and reinstatement of lead flashings, new rainwater goods, renewal of rotted external timbers, reinstatement of the missing floor, pointing of chimneys, removal of boards which had covered the windows and doors and their refurbishment, thus improving ventilation as they had been the main cause of dampness and rot, and finally a thorough repaint. The work undertaken here has primarily concentrated on the exterior and has secured the future of these two attractive and listed buildings. Although the two are currently unoccupied, there are plans by the Dumfries Station Trust to convert one into a bookshop and the other into a meeting room for local guided walks. The final entry was made by Network Rail for the restoration of the station building at Goostre in Cheshire. Goostre is a local station on the former Manchester and Birmingham railway line located between Crewe and Wilmslow. Around 1890, the London and North Western Railway undertook a scheme to upgrade the facilities at the station. The main elements of this were the provision of a new timber-built station buildings with the main building on the downside and a smaller building on the up. The LNWR was an extensive user of timber for station buildings. At an early stage, a modular form of construction was adopted where each building was made up from a small range of standard modules. Over the years, several hundred station and platform buildings to these designs were built all over the LNWR system. Unfortunately today, only a small handful remain, of which Goustre is perhaps the best example. Inevitably, a significant amount of the timber in the windows, external cladding and floor needed to be replaced. Care was taken to ensure that the new materials were of suitable quality and were made to the same profiles and designs of the originals. The distinctive and prominent feature of these buildings is the design of the sash windows. A local specialist manufacturer was engaged to fabricate new windows in wood to the original design. A feature of these buildings was the eaves bracket supporting the canopy roof. Goostre features the most ornate pattern of these. On examination, two of these were found to be broken, and being such a distinctive feature, and for uniformity, it was decided to have two new brackets made as castings to the original design. Internally, in order to maximise the space, the partitions were removed. Overall, this is a very well executed scheme, which has restored a building at risk to usable condition and which should give it a significant future lifespan. The decisions to restore it to its original appearance is most commendable, particularly as the building was not listed. Three very interesting projects, but only one can win. So which of this trio has won the Network Rail Community Award? The winner for 2020 is Network Rail for the remarkable transformation of Goose Street Station. We now come to the South Eastern Commercial Restoration Award and there are three shortlisted entries in this category. The first of these is to Loftco for the restoration of the main station building at Cardiff Bay Station. The Grade 2 listed building at what is now known as Cardiff Bay Station, but which was called Cardiff Butte Road from 1924 to 1994, was opened in the early 1840s by the Taff Vale Railway. The engineer for the railway was Isambard Kingdom Brunel. Used as the railway's headquarters until 1862, the building had a variety of uses, with part functioning as the booking office. In the 1980s, the station was restored as a railway museum, but following the museum's closure in 1997, the building was empty for more than two decades and it became derelict. By 2017, 
it had appeared on the Victorian Society's list of the ten most endangered buildings. Work started in November 2018 on an eight-month project costing £900,000 to convert the building, now rechristened Platform, into 23 office units along with a separate cocktail bar. Externally, the roof has been reslated, the prominent chimneys have been restored and the external stucco has been repaired and repainted. In addition, the rainwater goods have been replaced and supplemented in cast metal, whilst the surviving door and window features have been retained and repaired. Internally, the ravages of time and multiple changes of use had resulted in the loss of all historic internal features, but the conversion of the space into the office units has been handled well and the standard of workmanship is excellent. Every inch has been skillfully designed to maximise usage, but there is no feeling of it being unduly cramped. One aspect of the development that warrants special attention is the fact that the developer has tried to encourage traditional building skills. The work undertaken show a positive desire to retain these skills and to pass them on to others. In all aspects, this is an extremely worthwhile entry. Our second shortlisted entry was made by Carter Leisure Services Limited for work converting part of Lincoln Station into a coffee shop and retail unit. Known as Lincoln Central until 2005, the Grade 2 listed station was designed by John Henry Taylor and was opened by the Great Northern Railway. The substantial stone-built building was completed in a Neo-Tudor style. The project to convert the waiting room into the Costa and Traveline shop was the result of a project undertaken by East Midlands Trains to reorder the station to include improved toilets and baby changing facilities. This impacted on the existing catering facilities and so between June and August a new cafe and shop was created in a project costing a quarter of a million pounds. Internally, the work included the removal of the existing suspended ceiling, repairs to the original lath and lime plaster ceiling, and the retention and restoration of surviving original features, such as the cornice and picture rails, as well as their replacement where needed on a like-for-like -like basis. In addition, the wooden window frames were repaired these had suffered damage, particularly when hidden by the suspended ceiling. The space thus created has been sympathetically fitted out to serve as a cafe with an additional seating area. The herringbone style flooring and wall tiling are attractive and completed to a good standard, whilst the overall design of the decoration, including the lighting, is excellent. The finished project appears to be well executed with a welcoming feel that enhances and extends the space within the station which is accessible to the public. It sets a good standard for any further work that might take place within the building, which is itself generally well maintained and an important gateway to Lincoln. The third entry in this category was entered by Transport for London and covers the conversion of the arches at Wood Lane into retail and leisure units. The arches were constructed by the Metropolitan Railway in conjunction with the Great Western Railway in the early 1860s. Part of the structure was incorporated into the new White City Station in 2008. In all, Transport for London owns 31 arches at Wood Lane, the majority of which were unused. The structure lies at the heart of the White City Opportunity Area, and this scheme offered TfL the opportunity of refurbishing and regenerating the arches for commercial use. 19 arches have been completed in Phase 1, 13 are available for rent as retail units, while 3 are for pedestrian use to open up better street level access between the two sides of the railway viaduct, and 3 are service arches. 
The work involved removing the existing vegetation in the area and bringing the disused arches into good condition. The brickwork was cleaned and renovated, in some cases removing paint and graffiti, and the temporary coverings that had been placed on the arches were removed and replaced with new glazing and frontages. Each arch was refurbished to form an empty unit with a shop front suitable for retail. New frontages were installed on the arches with standard fixtures for retail inside. The arches have been designed by Fletcher Priest Architects with the flexibility for some to be interlinked and all to have active dual frontages to both neighbouring Westfield and Barclay St James schemes. The public access through the arches connects the two adjoining developments to each other and to the surrounding area. The work to the arches has been carried out to a high standard matching the quality of the adjoining developments and creating a new community in a previously run-down part of London. Three very impressive entries, I think you'll agree, that which of the trio whetted our adjudicator's appetite the most. The winner of the Southeastern Commercial Restoration Award for 2020 is Loftco for the rescue and restoration of Brunel Station Building at Cardiff Bay. Every year the awards have some slight quirk to them and this year has proved to be no exception. Among the entries were three small but important schemes that featured the restorations of the graves of several people who had a significant role in railway history. In recognition of this, the adjudicators decided that each of the three would be awarded a special chairman's highly commended certificate. The first of this trio was made by Andy Savage and covers the restoration of the grave of Bessie and William Jones in the graveyard at Bettis Garman in North Wales. Mrs Jones and Mr Jones were connected with the Festiniog Railway. Mrs Jones was famed in the 1930s and later, in early preservation days, for her role wearing Welsh costume in greeting trains at Tanny Bush. Mr Jones was responsible for the railway's permanent way. Their grave reflects this lifetime's association with an attractive side panel carved with representations of the railway. Since erection in 1981, the principal fixing securing the headstone had eroded, causing the headstone to collapse. It lay on the ground in a sorry state. The entrant, motivated for personal reasons, sought to restore the grave out of respect for Mr and Mrs Jones, and with the consent of the family, a restoration plan was agreed that used new non-corrosive fixings which should ensure a long and low maintenance life. At the same time, restoration and cleaning was undertaken and new chippings provided to improve the overall impact. Overall, this is a great piece of work, both for the reason for doing it and its execution. It is something that could have been overlooked, but it was not. It reminds us of the connection between these people and the railway's history, and restoring the grave is a good way to do that. The second entry, made by the parochial church of the Harwich Peninsula Team Ministry, features the work undertaken on the memorial to Captain Charles Fryatt in the graveyard at All Saints Church, Dovercourt. After Captain Fryatt's funeral in St Paul's Cathedral in July 1919, his body was interred at All Saints Church and this monument was erected in his honour. Captain Fryatt was a British mariner employed by the Great Eastern Railway who was executed by the Germans for attempting to ram a U-boat in 1915. When his ship, the SS Brussels, was captured off the Netherlands in 1916, he was court-martialed and sentenced to death, although he was a civilian non-combatant. 
International outrage followed his execution near Bruges in July 1916. After the war, his remains were returned to the UK, one of only three bodies to be formally repatriated after the war, the other two being Edith Cavell and the unknown soldier, now buried in Westminster Abbey. The memorial to Captain Fryatt has been restored very well. The sandstone has been sensitively cleaned, leaving the mouldings sharp and clean. The lettering on the front panel, giving the reason for the memorial, has been correctly executed in the same lettering style and the new letters cannot be noticed. The completed work has been well handled, bringing the story of Captain Fryatt back from relative obscurity to his proper place as one of the victims of World War I. The final example in this fascinating trio covers the grave of the Railway King, George Hudson, in the graveyard of Scraingham Church in Yorkshire, and was entered by the friends of Scraingham and Leppington Village. The grave of George Hudson is located adjacent to the south porch of Scraingham Church, a church which witnessed both his baptism and burial. The Church of St Peter and St Paul is listed at Grade 2 and fittingly was restored and partially rebuilt in 1853 by the architect G. T. Andrews, who had such a connection with George Hudson and who designed many railway buildings in North East England. Over the years, the condition of this gravestone had deteriorated considerably and so, with the support of the Railway Heritage Trust and the Stevenson Locomotive Society, the entrance undertook its restoration during the late spring of 2019. The stonework curb surround to the grave has been cleaned, restored and redressed and the coped stone granite tombstone cleaned. New paving stones have been installed to replace those that had been broken over the past 148 years. The quality of the replacement stonework is good, so that the finished product is a fitting tribute to George Hudson. Congratulations to all these three entrants for the dedication to these important but previously overlooked graves and memorials. Hopefully their work will inspire others to look at such historic features in the future. Most years there are entries that are of importance but do not necessarily fall easily into any of the ward categories, but which, in the view of the committee, merit recognition. This year, the spectacular new overall roof at Dublin Pier Station, entered by Irish Rail, comes into this category, and it has been decided to make a Chairman's Special Award to recognise this work. Pierce was the first railway station to be built in Dublin, and opened for service on the 17th of December 1834 as Westland Row Station the city terminus of the Dublin and Kingstown Railway. In the 1880s, a new roof was provided with a main span covering the two long main platforms and a shorter span covering the adjoining bay platforms on the south side. The station was renamed Dublin Pierce in 1966. A condition survey and structural report showed that the 1880s roofs were now in poor condition and beyond conservation or restoration. The roofs were not listed structures. To avoid seeking planning permission, the entrant agreed to replace the 1884 roof with a similar roof in modern materials. The site had severe constraints to execute the construction with a number of buildings in very close proximity. This meant that seeking planning permission for more modern roof designs was likely to be a protracted process which could have resulted in lengthy delays. To ensure the continuous running of the railway below, the contractors initiated a moving temporary platform along the passenger platforms with the old roof being removed gradually 
to be replaced with the new. The overall effect of the replacement roof creates a sense of space and improved natural lighting within the main train hall while enclosing it from the weather. This is very much to the benefit of the travelling public. The internal brickwork is also enhanced from this new lighting effect. Overall, this entry illustrates what can be achieved on a constricted historical site with modern materials and well-planned temporary works to produce a historically relevant roof structure which is admired by the travelling public. This is an imaginative scheme that has made a virtue of a necessity. The existing roof was life expired, but its replacement maintains the link, spirit and spectacle of the original. The entrants are worthy winners of this chairman's special award. Our final award this morning is given to what the awards committee judged to be the best entry in any category. The selection of the best entry each year is difficult, as there is always, as we have seen, a number of excellent and varied schemes. But I'm pleased to announce that this year's overall winner goes to the University of Northampton for its imaginative conversion of the former Midland Railway locomotive shed in the town into accommodation for the Students' Union. The Grade 2 listed engine shed dates to the early 1870s and the opening of the Midland Railway's line from Bedford to Northampton. The Midland Station, St John Street, closed in 1939 and the site is now occupied by one of the University's halls of residence. Following the creation of the London, Midland and Scottish Railways in 1923, the engine shed was converted into wagon works. It remained in railway use until 1998. Suffering fire damage in 2000, the building remained largely underutilised and then abandoned for more than a decade before work commenced in 2014 to safeguard it. Following stabilisation, work commenced in mid-2016 on a two-year project costing just over £4 million to restore and convert the building. The work was part funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. Externally, the work included the cleaning and repair of the brickwork, the retention and refurbishment of the existing cast iron window frames, and substantial work to restore and replace the original roof prior to being reslated. The restored clerestory originally provided for smoke ventilation, fittingly now houses the building's ventilation system. Internally, the original ash and inspection pits were excavated and recorded before being carefully preserved under the new floor. The flooring incorporates a representation of where the track once stood. A really impressive feature is the lengths that the University and Students' Union have gone to explain the history and context of the building. The well-designed interior allows for the appreciation of the original structure whilst creating a space convenient for users in the 21st century. Also covered by the work was the small adjacent office building. The work here included the replacement of the entire roof on a like-for-like -like basis as the original was severely degraded. The space created is now used as a base by the housekeeping team employed on the adjacent residences. All told, this is a really impressive reuse of a building which otherwise could so easily have been lost, which successfully combines well-restored and referenced heritage features with use as an important amenity 
for the students at Northampton University. We usually follow the review by our guest of honour saying a few words. This year, Andrew Haynes, Chief Executive of Network Rail, accepted our invitation. Andrew left university and joined BR as a management trainee in 1985. He worked on the southern region to start with, including a spell at Hearn Hill, a station that has featured in the awards recently. I worked in the same basement at Storey's Gate near the House of Parliament with him when he was writing answers to the, the BR chairman's trickier letters in 1989, while I was dousing, or was I creating, mayhem by leading the Channel Tunnel Rail Link Bill consultation. He went on via rail track to run Southwest Trains and later First Group Rail in the 2000s, before moving to nine years as Chief Executive Officer of the Civil Aviation Authority. He returned to his roots in 2018 at Network Rail. Given that he has a Welsh upbringing, I am pleased that we have managed to find one of the winners in, on his local railway. Anyway, Andrew, over to you. It's a pleasure to be joining you for this year's awards. Many, many congratulations to the NRHA for continuing its great work in these challenging times. You know, it's all too easy to retreat and lie low till this awful pandemic is over. So more than ever, I'd like to take a moment to recognise all the hard work that all the nominees have put in over the last year. It's been a challenging, challenging time, not only for our rail industry, but for the whole country. And your contribution to the preservation of our railways is deeply, deeply appreciated. As Theo said, my journey with the railway began some 35 years ago, just as we were coming out of an era where respect for the past was something we either felt we couldn't afford or else was inconsistent with the modern rail system. And throughout that time, the NRHA has played a critical role in demonstrating the folly of that approach. And indeed, in the 40 years since these awards were formed, we have seen some really, really impressive work completed to restore the railways. Now, my personal passionate interest outside of work is not so much railways, but architecture. So please don't underestimate my real personal pleasure at seeing and hearing about these excellent projects. But it's so much more than that. The railways play an enormous part in the history of our country. They've shaped economic activity and prosperity for more than 200 years. You know, I was born less than a mile from where the very first steam locomotive in the world made its inaugural run as part of the ironworks infrastructure in South Wales. We're also Britain's biggest neighbour, so we have a profound responsibility to create and preserve spaces that lift spirits, provide inspiration, demonstrate welcome and engender pride. And that is why respect for our rich heritage alongside a deep creative approach to all that innovation can bring is critical in develop, delivering that mission and trust. These awards are highlighting the inspiring and necessary work that you all do to restore and maintain that rich heritage of our railways. Your work is helping to create a legacy for future generations and you should all be incredibly proud. Your hard work and your dedication to maintaining our iconic railway system is truly, truly inspirational. Congratulations to all of today's winners. Now, it's my turn to make a few announcements. First, I should like to pay tribute to the huge contribution Richard Tinker made to the railway and its architecture generally, but specifically the Settle and Carlisle Line, the Railway Heritage Trust, where he was secretary for 10 years, and to the National Rail Heritage Awards, where he was a judge as recently as last year, an awards manager for some time. Sadly, he died in September, aged 81, after a, a short illness. We shall miss him greatly. I am pleased to announce that the following have agreed to become patrons of the National Railway Heritage Awards in recognition for their contributions. Gordon Biddle, whose 90th birthday we celebrated in January, Jim Cornell, John Ellis and David Allen. 
Chris Smythe, who represented the Heritage Railway Association as their nominated trustee for many years, has retired, and we welcome Stephen Oates in his place. Robin Lalou, another stalwart of the National Rail Heritage Awards, has announced his intention to retire as chairman of the adjudicators this year. We thank him for his counsel and efforts. He will be replaced as chairman by Gavin Johns, a long established member of our committee and previously joint chairman of the judges. Clive Baker will now become sole chairman of the judges. We welcome Jerry Swift as our trust secretary and pay tribute to his long established predecessor, Mike Stanbury, who happily remains as our archivist. I thank the judges and adjudicators, as well as my trustees and committee members, who have seen through this difficult competition in the difficult environment of this year. Our thanks are due to Robert Hayward and Peter Waller, who normally organise the physical ceremony and who this year have been forced to learn new skills in putting together the virtual presentation. Also, Malcolm Wood, who organises the plaques. The event would not have been possible without Dan Neagle and his team at Paraguard AV, and I would like to recognise and express my gratitude to them for their work and advice. I also thank our sponsors who have stayed with us. Long may this continue. We are particularly grateful to Sir Peter and Lady Sue Hendy for backing the awards personally, as well as through Network Rail. I should remind you that we published a book, Restoration Rewarded by Robin Lelou, last year, uh, which covers the 40 years of the competition. Also, two of our judges, Rob Thornton and Malcolm Wood, have just produced the book, The Architecture and Legacy of British Railway Arc Buildings. What a happy coincidence that one of the best Harlow Town is among those, the winners today. This presentation and the press release will be available on the National Rail Heritage Awards website forthwith. I thank you all for listening and look forward to seeing you at Merchant Taylor's Hall at 10.30 on 1st of December 2021, when I trust that normal service will be resumed. I am delighted to say that Andrew Haynes uh, has agreed to return as our guest of honour and thank him for his um, work today. Mm -hmm.